Well, thank you very much for being here. And that's uh, terrific. Uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners. That's the Yukanji and the Dimoy Walabara Yudinji, and whose lands, of course, we're having this today and pay uh, our respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I also want to thank uh, the university because it's a fairly new thing for the university to actually have this sort of conversation about topical and, dare I say, political issues. Um, so hats off to the uni and hats off to Yoko and Bill for having us here today. So thank you for that. Um, Stephen, well, very few people here will not be familiar with Stephen and the work he's done over. He and I have known each other for 25 years and I've um, worked together on numerous campaigns, including uh, protection of False Cape and the protection of East Trinity. And uh, a lot of you will know him as a photographer uh, par excellence, you know, a person who just produces the most amazing images. But he's really a, he's a bushman. He's a man who loves the country. He's a man who uh, thrives in being out there. And as we know, to protect the environment, you've really got to be in it and if, so in order to love it and to want to protect it. And Stephen has been foremost in that thinking for quite some time. And uh, in all of the campaigns that you've been involved in, that's been the focus. It's all about a conservation outcome. It's about connecting people to the outside world, connecting people to the nature around us and uh, the wonders. Uh, and this is what he's going to be talking about today, the threats to that as a result of uh, inappropriate uh, wind farm uh, developments in a uh, country which uh, we would argue is tangential to the needs of wind power. And uh, it's um, a campaign that Stephen has led with, uh, I would say, tenacity. Um, and he's always patient, nice to people. He's such a gentleman and uh, a wonderful person. And I think that his manner has allowed this debate to widen and then broaden a broader church of opinion into this conversation, which we otherwise would not have. So. Without further ado, I'm going to pass it to Stephen, and uh, I'm really looking forward to your conversation and your presentation today, Stephen. Yes, thank you very thank much. much. Thank you. Thanks, Thomas. And we'll take questions at the end. Yes, thank you. Yes, yeah, so thank you, everyone, for being here this evening. Can you hear me loud and clear? Yes. Yep. Yep. Yes, yeah, so, <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Dennis. Renewable energy in Australia is, is, is proceeding at a crackneck speed. And I suppose I've seen it at the front line and what is happening. And um, a few, quite a few people here have already seen the third part of this presentation and the second, the two third, the other, the last two thirds will be more about uh, the rollout of renewables statewide. So, now, I generally start with this photograph because this gives you an idea of the context of the scale. So what we've got here is a wind blade going through uh, um, Tolga up on the Atherton Tablelands. And this was for the Mount Emma wind farm, and it's 57 metres long. The, you might have heard, heard of the Caban wind farm. Those blades are 79 metres long. Shalumban will be 89 metres long, and Upper Burdekin will be 100 metres long. So the blade lengths are increasing by 10 metres per year. Um, so you can see the huge size of the components. Um, they're quite large. And the reason why I show these is so you can understand what's needed to get these components up into some of the most inaccessible places in Queensland. Really high ridge lines, remote access, and the roads need to be engineered for infrastructure like this. This is a 12 tonne blade. Uh, Shalumban will be double that, over 20 tonne. Then the cell, the centre gearbox, is 400 tonne. So we need to get 400 tonne pieces of machinery up mountains, or in, in the case of Shalumban, up 300 metres up ridge lines. They're basically the same as from here up to Karanda. Um, I start with the Mount Emerald Wind Farm, because I was, I was quite connected with Mount Emerald. But in, in the day, or back in the early 2000s, I'd walked all over it. I, I saw the beauty in that, that table tabletop country. It had never been cleared. There had never been any grazing. Uh, there was no weeds, no impact, and it was in a, a pristine state. 
And then today, it's an industrial site. So there's haulage roads, substations, power lines, cuttings. And at the time, um, you know, this is what we all agree. This is what we need. We need to reach our targets. We need to decarbonise. And this is what we needed to do. So the proponents said this, this um, you know, Mount Emerald would power 70,000 homes. I'll show you later that it doesn't. It actually only powers 10,000 homes some of the time. And in actual fact, it ran for two months in 2022, delivering no power whatsoever, zero. <laughs> but I'll talk about that later. <clears throat> um, I'll move on to Caban. So I photographed Mount Emerald. I saw the scale, the impact, you know, and I thought, well, Mount Emerald is, that's all we need for North Queensland, 70,000 homes. Um, combine that with the Barron Hydro, Korea Hydro, we're set. There's only about 50,000 houses in, in cans, you know, we're sorted. Um, and then someone tipped me off and said, oh, there's another big wind farm going at Caban. So I decided to go there and photograph it, um, in particular, the magnificent brood frog, which was actually discovered on that site of the Caban wind farm site. Um, so I went there and, and tried to photograph it and document it, um, but I was too late. Uh, the dozers had already gone in there and started clearing. So the dozers go in and clear all the access road, roads, and this is only 28 turbines. So 28 turbines, Shalumban's 86, uh, Upper Burdekin's around, um, I've forgotten now, there's around 100 turbines, Mount Fox, uh, and now we've just found out about a new one called Karma Wind Farm. So anyway, so a lot of earth moving, clearing on high ridge lines, um, great habitat cleared. Um, here we have a habitat tree, so lots of habitat trees through the site. Um, what the dozers do is clear around the habitat trees first, and then they'll come in the next day and knock over the habitat trees with the ecologist to, to remove any uh, fauna that may be in any den. So obviously this has had like a den up the top, and they would have knocked this over the next day. Um, so the Caban site is nestled in between the Bluff State Forest and also Evelyn Creek Conservation Park. Um, so a really good piece of forest there, great connectivity. Uh, and that's the turbine footprint. Yeah, and the reason why I'm showing these photos is because this is a small wind farm. We have many more of these in the pipeline. And most Australians and most Queenslanders don't know what's in the pipeline. This is all classified remnant forest. Um, uh, northern coral habitat. Uh, that hilltop now has been completely excavated. Dynamite is used in the, uh, in the, the blasting out of the turbine pads. Um, oh, that's yeah, a shot there of them cutting into that hill that you just saw previously. Um, just here, that's another haulage road, and there's now another haulage road going down the back here with turbines right down the back. Yeah, yeah a lot of vegetation cleared. Yeah, and that's that ridge line. Now there's 20, only 28 turbines. Uh, you can see the turbine pads. Um, I noticed there's a little bit of sediment control just over here. Uh, magnificent brood frog was actually discovered just down the bottom here. A uh, lot of civil earth moving, a lot of earth moving, infrastructure, um, uh, rock breaking. Yeah, so you can sort of see what's involved, okay? So we often think of wind farms going into uh, rolling sheep fields of Scandinavia, but when you put these, this sort of industry into an Australian context, into an Australian bushland context, it's quite a brutal industry on the landscape.
Uh, anyone can hear that? Skype. Apply from currents. Uh. Yeah, so it's not necessarily the clearing of the forest, but it's all—it's the fragmentation. Um, so with Caban, for example, you know, many, many kilometres of new roads are being punched into the site. And it's just not the clearing, but it's the edge effects. And uh, ecologists will tell you there's around about 200 metres of edge effects on either side of the road where there's increased light, um, the incursion of weeds, and also um, the disruption of fire regimes. Fires are now managed to protect infrastructure and not for ecology and, and for biodiversity. Um, the Shalumban project, which I'll talk about next, consists of 145 kilometres of new roads, Upper Burdekin, 200 kilometres of new roads, and then nearby Mount Fox, around another 50 kilometres of new roads. And so it's the cumulative effect of potentially thousands of kilometres of new roads punched through really inaccessible, high biodiversity, high elevation areas of Queensland. The scale is, is enormous. And I'll show you maps later. So you can see why the roads need to be so big because of those big components that need to be moved onto site. Um, in actual fact, where they put this crane, see if that works on. This crane, they need to compact the ground there very heavily to take the weight. So a lot of compact um, uh, uh, compaction of ground to, to really take all that heavy industry and heavy weight, the heavy machinery. Um, yeah, so again, Caban site, fragmentation of forests. And while I was at Caban, I heard of Shalumban and didn't even know what Shalumban was, had no idea. So I went home and Googled Shalumban and lo and behold, found out that the Shalumban project is five times or four or five times bigger than Caban in even more remote country, hard up against the World Heritage Area, the Wet Tropics World Heritage Area. And it just blew me away. So what we're seeing here is the site. So if you can imagine those haulage roads that we just saw at Caban being punched through forests like this. The left side is World Heritage Area in this photograph. The right-hand side will be punched up with roads <laughs> and haulage roads. I've got to laugh because it's so stupid. <laughs> it's just so ridiculous. These are the maps initially that the proponents give to the community. So they really downplay the effects. Um, you can see the dotted lines, which they say are just access tracks. They're not access tracks. These are haulage roads up to 50 metres wide when you consider the cut and fill. So it makes you wonder, well, what, what is that country really like? So we did a little bit of mapping. And so we digitised in the footprint and then see where it is in proximity to the World Heritage Area because none of the maps from the proponent actually show you. So initially we did some mapping and you can see that the, the roads are quite close to the World Heritage Area. And then you work out, well, why are the roads there? And then you overlay it onto a topo map and then you understand that they're targeting all the high ridge lines, the knolls, the rock pavements, the high elevation areas. So the roads are being punched up all the ridge lines. So you can imagine the cut and fill that's required to do that. And if you delve a little bit deeper, Oh, I don't know why. What happened there? Oh, that's one with the legend. Sorry. Yeah. So I've got a legend here on this one. And then if you look closer and you start looking at the elevation, you can see that the road coming in off Aurora Road is at um, 600 metres, six to 700 metres elevation, and the roads will, will actually go up to not, um, – uh, eight to 900 metres elevation. So we're looking at 300 metres of elevation gain with some of those roads being punched up into those ridges. Um, so those that are unfamiliar with Shalumban, Raven's Home is just to the north, up here. 
yeah, raven toes up the top. Then when we overlay the vegetation mapping, we can see that the roads are actually going into, on this map, purple areas, which indicate endangered dominant vegetation and endangered subdominant vegetation. <laughs> Sorry, I've got to laugh. Um, yeah, so we've got these big pieces of infrastructure going into really good remnant wet sclerophyll forests of Queensland. Um, you know, so typical forests like this, which I photographed. And then it makes it made us wonder, well, we now, now know about, um, you know, obviously there's Mount Emerald, Caban, Shalumban. What else is in the pipeline? So we did some digging around. And when I say digging, rainforest reserves and, and friends and colleagues, because it's really hard to find. It's really hard to find the data of what projects are out there in the pipeline. And I'll talk a bit, a little bit later about the, the process that these projects go through. Um, the, 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 well, the streamlined process, which is code for no process. So these are the projects in the pipeline between Ingham and Lakeland. Um, the Mount Emerald Wind Farm, that's green up the top, that's completed. Uh, what I want to do is talk about the four orange projects at the bottom. Um, so with these projects, we've mapped them and there's about 14,100 hectares of classified remnant forest to be cleared for these projects. That's just between Ingham and Lakeland at a cost of $10.4 billion. So what I want to do first is talk about the Kidston Pumped Hydro. And we hear a lot about the Kidston Pumped Hydro. It's a great project. Oh, sorry. It's a great project. Um, what it does, there's, with, there's water being pumped between the two old gold pits up the top here, the top right, and being powered by the solar farm over the, um, um, over the quarry, um, what do you call it, the spillage area, uh, it's tailings dam, or the tailings area. So on the face of it, it looks like a great project. You know, there's no environmental harm in terms of forest clearance. Um, so it looks quite good. But then you've got to remember, this is only stage one, and no one talks about stage two. And stage two needs to clear 1,900 hectares of Fenida forest <laughs> with solar panels. I've got to laugh. Um, otherwise, I'd go nah, mad. So stage two is clearing 1,900 hectares of Fenida forest which is that forest. <laughs> so that's Kidston. So when people, people say, oh, Kid, Kidston's great, stage one's great, stage two's not. <laughs> no one talked about stage two. Then we look at Desailly Energy Park, and we only found out about, well, I found out about, about Desailly Energy Park because I live in Mariba Shire, and I go through the council minutes each, every month. And there was an item that came through to Desailly Energy Park. So I looked at it and read it, and it was like a 200-page document for this massive solar farm off the Mulligan Highway next to Brooklyn Nature Refuge on the McLeod River, and it was approved by delegated authority by the council CEO, Marie Bashire. <laughs> um, and now it's sitting with the state. So, and in that document, it didn't say anywhere how much land was to be cleared. So I went into Google Earth and drew a polygon, and this is 2,400 hectares of savannah woodlands to be cleared for a solar farm. <laughs> Mind you, um, some residents up there have just tipped me off saying that there's, there's been some um, wind monitoring towers put up on the Desailly Range as well, just north of here. Um, so there's probably going to be a wind farm, a proposed wind farm going up on the Megup Mulligan Highway on the Desailly Range. So you know that lookout that you pass on the way to Cooktown, you stop and get out and have a look at the big view? Those mountains behind, or not, not in the foreground, but behind you, those mountains, potentially wind farm. Yeah, so that's, that's the country to be cleared there at Desailly. You know, no one knows about this. You know, here we are trying to fight broad scale land clearing in Queensland, we fought for the Vegetation Management Act and the Vegetation Management Act is exempt from renewable projects. 
high road wind farm. On the face of it, it looks like a you know a fairly good project. It's on cleared land. There's turbine pads going into really good remnant forest. Looks okay, you know, in the scheme of all the other projects, not too bad. But you have to remember they need to punch a, a 12 kilometre, 30 metre wide transmission line through the Bluff State Forest to connect it to the adjacent high transmission line. Um, Emily, I don't know if Emily's here, but she's doing research on the magnificent brood frog, and I went out with her frog monitoring a few months ago, and we and she's monitoring frogs right there, right underneath where the transmission towers are gone. <laughs> yep, so. So it's just not the project site, but it's also how those sites are connected to transmission lines. The reason why it will go through state forest, because state forests are free, if the transmission lines go through freehold land, they're going to have to pay money to landholders as a lease. It's all about money. It's cheaper to trash forests than go through cleared land. And then the monster of them all is the Upper Burdekin Wind Farm. This is a shot from the top of uh, Mount Fox Crater looking southwest. We just found last week the Karma Wind Farm, and that's being built to the southwest of Mount Fox. All those mountains there, wind turbines in the distance. Mount Fox, this is looking east. All that country below to the east is the Mount Fox Energy Park, another 55 turbines. Wonderful country, beautiful, full of rufous bedongs, everything. <coughs> this is looking north, and all that country you see to the horizon, really, to the north is the Upper Burdekin Wind Farm site. The Upper Burdekin Wind Farm site is magnificent. Koalas, um, my mate Dominic photographed this shaman on the turbine pad of where a turbine's going. That's my photo of a koala right next to where a haulage road is going on the site. It's quite bizarre being just west of Ingham, about 20 kilometres as the crow flies west of Ingham, <coughs> seeing koalas in North Queensland. It's, it's a surreal experience. Rock art, I do believe there's more rock art up in the gorges. The wind farm will have to go through, across two gorge systems. The country is very similar to the Mount Zero AWC property just to the south. And again, we had to do our, our own mapping and footprint. So that's the footprint of the Mount Fox Energy Park, um, Mount Fox Wind Farm. Um, and then that yellow polygon is the footprint of the Mount Fox Energy Park with another 55 turbines. And just here will be the Karma Wind Farm in here, going into that area. Now, if you overlay the Upper Burdekin Wind Farm footprint over the city of Cairns, this shows you the scale. So quite a, a really big area of fragmentation. Again, when we overlay the footprint, we see that all those turbines are going into the high ridge lines. And then the vegetation mapping. Yeah, so the, the Upper Burdekin site has rock piles like you can see on the left. Those photos have actually come from the ecology report on that site. And the site is littered with these uh, um, rock piles full of shaman rock wallabies. And they're found on the ridge lines and they're just gonna get blasted out. The Upper Burdekin site was actually earmarked for national park acquisition down the line. Uh, Princess Hills National Park is further to the north, up, up the top. Then Waruna, Oak Hills, I think Oak Hills actually extends a bit into this area here, and then the Upper Burdekin site. So great connectivity with the wet tropics and uh, potentially could have been a great addition to the National Park Protected Estate. Um, this shows the extent of the Shaman Rock Wallaby, uh, 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 the extent of the Shaman Rock Wallaby habitat area, which is that black polygon and you can see the wind farms really knocking out a big chunk of that habitat right in the guts. <clears throat> and then we have to wonder, well, why is it happening here? Why are they picking all these really good high biodiversity areas? 
What, why? When there's so much lower biodiverse areas out west, and it's all about the transmission lines. It's all about the lines. And I had no interest in electricity up until three years ago, and now it's my life. <laughs> and it's all about the transmission lines. So this is a map of North Queensland, and you can see here the red transmission lines going up the coast. This is the one here to the west of the wet tropics World heritage area, and then the one down the coast. We can see Mount Emerald here. And then if we overlay Caban, um, and then if you overlay Desailly up here, that's actually on the Cooktown line. I haven't mapped that in yet. And then the Shalumban project, and then the Upper Burdekin and Mount Fox project. They're all hugging the high voltage transmission lines. For the wind farms to be moved, to be constructed away from those transmission lines, it costs money. And it can vary from $1 million to $10 million per kilometre, depending on the tenure, the vegetation, the terrain, and a whole manner of things. When you look at these wind farms in context to the national parks and the World Heritage Area, um, you know, they're mostly hugging the Wet Tropics World Heritage Area and national parks. And then what's happening in Queensland? That's just, north, that's just North Queensland. So what's happening statewide? And this just blows my brain. So we've got 88 projects in the pipeline for Queensland. And it took a lot of work to get this. There's been a team of us trying to dig through websites, EPBC web referrals. I've noticed one mistake as I was doing a dummy run today that I've actually got Shlumban in there twice. So sorry about that. It's actually 87. So I've got it in there twice. If I just go back. Uh, hmm. These 87 projects will deliver 10 gigawatts of power for Queensland. So 10 gigawatts, and I'll talk more about that later. This is a map of Queensland. So in red are the footprints of all the wind farms and solar, sorry, all the wind farms that are proposed. The green polygons are wind farms that we don't know the exact footprint yet, but we know the property extents of the property boundaries, the subject properties. <clears throat> this one here is a ticking time bomb. There's about, that's, there's around 300 turbines going on top of the Yungala and Proserpine range, the coastal ranges. Um, that's, <laughs> it's, it's gonna be a big one. Um, so, what's happening there? So let's just look at a little, a little area between Rockhampton and Gladstone, for example, on this map. It's quite hard to see. We'll zoom in between Gladstone and Rockhampton. And that's what it looks like. So the red lines are wind farms. The green are national parks. Pink are state forests and brown are forestry reserves. Every scrap of high elevation country is now covered in turbines and haulage roads. Um, there's four there, water sown, infra, moonlight, and there's another, a boulder, boulder comb. We don't know the exact footprints of those turbines and the haulage roads, but we know the property boundaries. So they're just the external polygons of those blocks. Now, you've got to remember, like I said, those 87 projects will deliver 10 gigawatts. But the capacity factor of wind and solar is only, say, 15 to 30 percent. So in reality, it's only going to deliver two or three gigawatt. So everything you're seeing here will need to be times three. So we need to times this by three. I actually find it funny. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. Now, when we start looking at some of these, I haven't done the overlays yet for Rockhampton to Gladstone, but I've done a few for some other wind farms just north of Gladstone or north of Rockhampton, northwest of Rockhampton. So I'll just show you what's happening in regional Queensland. This is a Clark Creek wind farm. 
the left, this left one here, that's that's the satellite imagery. Getting my buttons confused. Satellite imagery. And that's the vegetation, regional ecosystems. The white area is cleared land. Green is no concern, but remnant, classified remnant forest. Yellow is of concern. And you can see turbines being punched right into of concern vegetation. When this went through the federal government, there was not one, not one environmental group that put in a submission. And same with Lotus Creek, which is even worse than this. Not one said, oh, maybe we should put the turbines out of the of concern vegetation. <laughs> you know. <clears throat> This is Clark Creek under construction right now. Um, yep, so no sediment control, no, oh, where are we? No erosion controls, huge amounts of fill just, just being pushed over the edges. These shots aren't mine. They were taken from a, a, a out of a plane. But look at that fill straight into the gully. <laughs> Um, yeah, this is happening in this, you know, uh, in this day and age. It just, it's, I find it amazing. Um, I ground truth this. I actually went up there, did some looking around. Uh, amazing diversity at night. Uh, incredible country. Remnants. Um, when you're up there, you go, wow, this is a great remnant forest. And you're looking down to the plains below, and it's just all cleared cattle country. So as far as you, oh, I can see, cleared cattle country, you're actually up in the high ranges in amongst the forest and it's being dynamited. Just smashing everything apart. I'm just going back to this slide. This Clark Creek will consist of 100 turbines. The turbine foundations consist of 1,200 cubic metres of reinforced concrete. They, uh, Clark Creek have two concrete batching plants running all day, every day, um, with concrete trucks putting cement into these turbine pads. You have to remember these only last 20 years, this infrastructure, um, and then we don't know what happens after that. Are they going to get pulled down, replaced? Don't know. All I can say that if these proponents walk away from the site, we'll, let be, we'll, be, we'll be left with quarries. Boomer Range, um, sorry, this is Lotus Creek. So this really breaks my heart and actually I get emotional even thinking about Lotus Creek. Wonderful, wonderful country. Uh, you can see here, it's not hitting any of concern vegetation, but it's going through some amazing remnant. The most koalas I've ever seen in my life. The ecology report for this project was 101 koalas were found within the project area with many females with cubs on their back. What you can see here, every ridge there smashed up. Here, every ridge smashed up. In an actual fact, there'll be a haulage road coming down this ridge. They're gonna somehow punch a road across Lotus Creek up here, and then all these ridges covered in turbines, smashed to smithereens. So then I did an overlay and put some of the mapping onto a Google map. So what we can see here on the right, oh, sorry, what we can see here on the right is an air photo of the site. And then the red lines indicate the edges of the haulage roads and the black dots of the turbine pads. So they're going up through here. So if we look at Boomer, um, Boomer Range, just north of, uh, northwest of uh, Rockhampton, again, we've got haulage roads being pumped through, pump, punched through of concern vegetation. The white area is all cleared land. That's all cleared. There's a little bit of remnant. Let's punch all the roads right through the guts of it. My best shot of, of greater gliders was taken right next to the Boomer Range site. And this is too big, but I'll just show you. Um, just here, I've got the shot of the, the greater gliders. This is Goodadulla National Park boundary right here. That turbine, when the blades turn perpendicular, they'll overhang into the National Park. <laughs> That's how close it is. 
So just going back to these 87 projects. So the total renewable electricity capacity, I've actually added Shlumber twice there. So it's actually 9,600, 9,500 9 megawatt. So 9,500 megawatt is in the pipeline with those 87 projects. But the capacity factor is 15 to 35%. So we need to times that by three. So we therefore need about 350 projects in Queensland to get to our target. But this excludes all the critical mineral mining, the rare earth mining to facilitate the rollout and also excludes the vast transmission infrastructure and backup storage and gas peaking plants when all this wind fails, when there's no wind. The total pumped hydro in that list that I just showed you in the 87 will consist of uh, 23,000 megawatt, which will only deliver about 10 hours of electricity. The entire grid is still going to have to be backed up by gas um, for when, for, for those times when we have wind droughts and 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 um, and yeah, I'll talk about wind droughts in a sec. I could do a whole test talk on wind droughts if you like. <laughs> So the total to be cleared using our mapping in the pipeline right now for Queensland is 60,000 hectares of classified remnant forest. That excludes the edge effects that I was talking about before, the 200 metres either side of the haulage roads. Now, the State Energy and Jobs Plan that was released in November last year says that we need 600,000 hectares of land will be required for 10 gigawatt, which sounds right. 10% of that would be classified as remnant, maybe. I don't know. I'll have to double check. But we need to times that by three. So that means we need 1.8 million hectares of land in Queensland for renewable projects to get to those targets. Now, if we start talking redundancy, we need to double that. And then if we start talking about hydrogen, double that. And if we want to be a green superpower, double that. <laughs> so the scale is enormous. And I don't think... Australians understand the scale. The Net Zero report came out last, not last Monday, the Monday before, and that's a really good report, and it's honest. And it basically says it's going to cost 1.5 trillion to get to 2030, and then 9 trillion to get over the 37 years for this build out. So 380 projects in Queensland. Um, and uh, multiply that across Australia, thousands upon thousands upon thousands. Why is it so expensive and why do we need so much wind? This is a part of the answer. So the Mount Emerald Wind Farm, which I really supported back in the day, I wanted to see Mount Emerald. It was going to, you know, be the, we can now say North Queensland that we're carbon neutral. The whole idea of wind farms is to be carbon neutral. But when you look at the data, it's far from it. So Mount Emerald Wind Farm in 2022, uh, for about 105 days, delivered less than 10 megawatt. So the maximum capacity for Mount Emerald is 180 megawatt. The average output, and this is what the wind farm people say and politicians, um, oh, the capacity factor is 26 or 30%. But you've got to look at the median, and the median has to be used because all the data is in the lower end of the data set. It's the median. So the median output for Mount Emerald was 18.1% capacity factor. So that means 50% of the time, 182 days, the generators produced this or less output. For 63 days, Mount Emerald produced zero megawatt. So for two months of 2022, it delivered zero power, nothing. This is a $400 million piece of kit that lasts 20 years. 107 days, Mount Emerald produced less than 10 megawatt. And you look at the wind modelling data, and Mount Emerald is supposed to be a high wind resource area. So something just doesn't make sense. I've elaborated a lot on why I think Mount Emerald doesn't even deliver carbon neutrality. And I've written it there. Um, it's going to be in the YouTube video. So when you're watching it again, just pause on this screen and you can read it. 
and then you can understand why I've come to the conclusion that Mount Emerald does not even deliver um, a carbon neutral benefit. When we start talking about hydrogen, this is another ball game. This is the Murchison hydrogen footprint in WA. So 700 turbines over 50,000 hectares, 10,000 hectares of solar and the dredging out of a deep water port. There's three of these up the WA coast. Um, yeah, so I'm not too sure how that's going to work. Um, the wind blows, you create hydrogen. The wind doesn't blow, you don't create hydrogen. So basically that horizon there will be turbines. Yeah. <clears throat> so my thoughts, and I'm going to be a bit controversial here. I don't expect everyone to agree, but these are my thoughts after looking at this. Should we be clearing and fragmenting forests for renewables? And are we going down the wrong path that has failed elsewhere? And where is our model for 100% renewables and which countries are carbon free? It is a climate emergency and all options need to be on the table. And we need to phase out of 75% coal and gas that we're consuming right now. And has to be replaced with clean energy options. And these are my solutions. I'm sure everyone's got ideas, um, but this is where I've come to in my journey, um, looking at energy over the last three years. And I'm not an academic, I'm not a scientist, but I'm just looking at the data and the facts. And I believe the solutions include renewables and rooftop solar, small community grids, locally owned wind farms, some industrial uh, with social license. You've got to bring the community with you and that they need to be on altered and degraded land. We cannot go smashing up prime koala habitat for wind farms. And the second is nuclear. And I believe nuclear has to be a part of our solution. And up until three years ago, I was vehemently against nuclear. I marched the streets against um, nuclear under Campbell Newman in 2013. I marched the streets against the Jabaluka uranium mine, which shouldn't go ahead. You know, there's great uranium deposits in, in, in low biodiverse areas. But I agree that nuclear, as depicted in the media, appears to have some scary shortcomings, such as waste, radiation, nuclear weapons, cost, slow rollout. However, my research has led me to understand I was misled about nuclear. And most, if not all, of the apparent scary shortcomings are not supported by the scientific literature. And I now see nuclear as an important piece of the solution to the climate crisis. And nuclear combined with appropriately placed renewables is a safe, cost-effective way to rapidly reduce fossil fuel generation. And if you, um, you dig down, you, people like James Hansen, who first warned of climate change to the US Senate back in the 80s, He's campaigning for nuclear. He sees nuclear as the solution. The Dalai Lama has made it very public that we need to embrace nuclear. It's really the, the, the best way to not harm the environment. James Lovelock, the author of the Gaia Hypothesis, is still, is, is, is written many, a lot about nuclear. It's really the only green solution. Dick Smith. And I did some research today on Dick Smith, and he actually campaigned in the media against the Mount Emerald wind farm. So he knew what we're now finding out. Um, so a new, uh, a new pre uh, respect for Dick Smith because he's been ahead of the game on this. Bill Gates right now is putting in his own nuclear plant at the Chimera uh, USA coal station facility. So the coal station is being decommissioned and one of his SMRs is being built on that site. So it's happening. And even our own Professor Bill Lawrence, who's not here tonight, has even written an open letter to environmentalists saying that we need to embrace nuclear energy. He knows that if we don't, we're going to see tens of thousands of kilometres of roads being punched through the last remnant patches of forest we've got in this country. Nuclear must be a part of our solution and nuclear eliminates the need for new transmission lines, provides enormous power generation in a tiny footprint. And within, we can, within 18 hectares, we can generate uh, 400 megawatt of power. 
<laughs> um, the latest polling indicates 61% of Australians are in favour of further investment in nuclear. And I was talking to some families out at Rockhampton who are being impacted upon by Clark Creek, Lotus Creek, Boomer Range, Moonlight Range, Mower Creek, Wind Farm. And the Stanwall Power Station, which is only 23 kilometres west of those wind farms, or 23 kilometres west of Rockhampton, between Rockhampton and those wind farms, the workforce there of 170 people have basically overwhelmingly said they want to transition to nuclear. We need a fast transition off fossil fuels. Renewables help in this regard. But in the long term, the barriers in place for nuclear must be lifted. And I'm certain they will be because there is no other way. 100% renewables require more materials, minerals, physical footprint that is incomprehensible and is far more expensive than nuclear as demonstrated in many other countries. Washington State have just announced 12 100 megawatt small SMRs to be built within 10 years on Ontario, Canada, installing SMRs. Rolls-Royce have just um, they'll be starting construction next year of SMRs right throughout England. These SMRs stand for small modular reactors. The United Arab Emirates just built three one gigawatt power plants within 10 years. 25% of their energy is now fossil free. They're the biggest oil producers on earth. Their electricity is the same as us, about 10 gigawatt. They're now, 25% of that is now nuclear. So they're on their path. <laughs> To reduction, I can't see Queensland ever getting near that within 10 years. Um, Japan's doubling down on nuclear. India have discovered that renewables are a waste of time. They're going nuclear. There's over 50 countries now that have sh shown interest in moving to nuclear. And I think Australia needs to be in the game on this. And I think over time, you'll find more people like myself, when we look at the data and the facts, um, we'll come to the conclusion that nuclear will have to be part of our power mix. So thank you, and I hope it's been an education for you all and, and uh, you understand a little bit more about what's happening across Queensland and Australia in terms of the rapid rollout of renewables. So thank you.